Okay, well, uh, I, I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'm, I'm Colin Moore. Um, I work in Clancy Moore with Andrew Clancy. Um, we, at the time of the book, both taught in Queens in Belfast, which is where I'm sitting. Um, and I suppose the genesis of the book is in the studio that we ran in the MARC in the master's course there, which looked at housing and economy. And um, the book is primarily the product of our students' work, uh, not our own. And I suppose it, it, it's really the joy of teaching is, is at once to be an architect and a student at the same time. Um, the motivation to study Fisker was uh, uh, one that was uh, one of slight intuition. I, I mean, we had seen the work, but very much uh, peripherally, and it had a, an enigmatic quality that really appealed to us. But actually um, looking for information um, that was more detailed, um, there was very little published uh, on Fisker's work uh, beyond uh, Denmark and in an English language context. Uh, I think we had seen some drawings previously also by students, uh, funnily enough, um, which were the work of Florian Beigel and Philip Christou in the CAS in London. And I think there certainly uh, there were images and drawings of the Hornback House scheme, which uh, piqued our interest. And so uh, we made a decision on the field trip that we would devote a considerable amount of time to make a survey of Fisker's work. Uh, specifically in Copenhagen, and chose three buildings to do so, um, which are which are detailed in the book. Um, I think, without getting into very much detail, uh, I mean they expose the incredible value of this work in the studio in universities that happen everywhere and all the time. And, and we were lucky to have the opportunity to to publish this, but. Um, the critical eyes of our students are really what makes it special. And I think they've intuitively drawn out Fisker's thesis, which is something to do with, in his own words, the conditions of life or an architecture that supports the conditions of life. And it was their ambition uh, in the making of the drawings to sort of expose uh, those conditions of life in the drawings. Uh, the, the next stage beyond the survey, the work went to Venice, actually the same student work when Andrew and I were invited by Shelley and Yvonne of Grafton Architects um, to be part of the Close Encounters exhibition, which was in the Venice Biennale. And we sort of self-published a version of the book, um, which became part of our exhibition there. Um, and that established the relationship with Lund Humphreys, which who produced the book here and with Valerie Rose. Um, who have been very patient and extremely supportive in, in producing um, the book that Andrew is now flicking through. Um, so I suppose that, that's a brief overview without getting into the detail of the book. Um, what we did uh, further to the student survey was really try and frame the work because the drawings speak for themselves and they really are the main body of research that's contained in the book. Um, but we have supplemented them with a series of essays uh, which frame the work, I suppose, culturally, socially, and within a kind of continuum of architectural discourse. And then on the other side of that, contemporaneously through the eyes of um, uh, three architects, which is Yob, ourselves, and, and Tony Fretton. Um, that's a kind of cursory overview of it. Um, what we had hoped to do today, as I said, uh, would be to use the book in a way as a conversation piece uh, uh, to dwell a little bit on the continuing relevance of, of the work, which is the whole purpose of making the publication. So Andrew has been flicking diligently and thank you. Um, perhaps yeah. Andrew, you, you might land on a page and, 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 and we could start a conversation. I. Like we had known us about Fisker, as Colin said, and then I was working in Aarhus University and traveling through Copenhagen. And I really didn't understand until I saw him. Like what you generally saw was the photograph of Hornbeck House and its kind of monumental scalelessness or its monumental scale. And then when you're going through it, it just feels so ordinary, so normative, so part of Copenhagen, so humane. And um, and then be kind of 
building up a conversation with Colm over the summer when I was in Aarhus and then with the idea that we'd set a field trip. And then there was this essay that we found, which was Job's essay in Oasi, which was this beautiful study of one of the projects that we went on to study in detail, which was uh, the square, as we call it, or Dronningham Garten. And uh, I'm not going to paraphrase that because we're going to get into that with Job in a second. But then there was this kind of English language critical treatment of Fisker. There were these amazing buildings. And then there was this really curious thing, which is that outside of Denmark, he was sort of known as a name, but not known by his works. And in Denmark, he was almost so well known that he was almost it was almost pointless to talk of Fisker, you know, because Fisker had basically dominated housing design and then he'd been head of the School of Architecture there for decades and sort of had become a kind of whole school of thinking in himself. So this idea that he was almost so territorial in Denmark, but almost too territorial for anywhere else, even though he did teach in Harvard and he was a very well regarded functionalist. And I think what we sort of got hooked into was this observation, which is that Hornbeck House, which is this huge building that we sort of open the book with uh, was finished in 1923 and I'm just going to open on the pay, on the plan of it um, this is 200 meters by 80 meters it's 290 apartments there's thousands of identical windows etc but it was finished in 1923 in September 1923 the same time as Verzi in Architecture was published by Corbusier and what we found kind of amazing about that serendipity was that here we saw a thesis about a future city in a building. And then over here, we saw a text, you know, by somebody else we, who we also admired, but polemic concerned with efficiency, concerned with the future as a language that would be applied. And in Fisker, we saw something different, which was less of a concern for efficiency. You know, each apartment has a front and back stairs. It makes a monumental garden with a single threshold. Like, and we see something much more to do with uh, yeah, the conditions of life, as Colin says, but basically maybe friction as being the generator of human contact so that you meet at doorways on stairs, you've got front and back doors. It seems much more grounded in understanding of how people socially interact, but also socially distance themselves and then how a city can be constituted from those very basic impulses. And then the second thing that's kind of amazing is the language of it, which is that, you know, Fisker, Fisker did have aspirations for polemical languages and later in his life he did actually despair a little bit that he hadn't done the works that he thought he could have done. He'd worked uh, with Leverance, for instance, he might have been thinking about Leverance, but he was much more attuned to what we call present tense kind of availabilities where he used the trades that were in the city, the materials that were in the city just around him, and he did have a kind of a consciousness of reference in the past. He was classicist, I suppose, in how he put them together. But what we found kind of amazing about it was that it became something other. It became something very much of that time. I mean, a future maybe being written in a time that felt almost natural, even at the same time as it was being extraordinarily radical. And so I'll stop wobbling on. But this kind of idea of architecture as being something then which is um, very attuned to the possibilities of its time and then very focused on what might come out of that and then this incredible architecture where all of his buildings, I think, most of them anyway, are still used for their original purpose centuries later. They're still incredibly loved, still incredibly successfully used. And their relationship with social housing and the kind of success of social housing in Denmark is something we might return to, but which something wasn't getting attention, say in Ireland where we're from, where there's a profound housing crisis. And there's constantly a conversation between politicians and economists about how to pay for something and where it should go. And there's very little conversation really about how do we build humanely at scale? How do we build enduringly? How do we build sustainably with maybe centuries in mind, as opposed to the quick fix to a housing problem, which is urgent, yes, but would be massively more problematic if we have knee-jerk reactions to it. So there were things that were kind of knocking around in our head as well. So I don't know if I'll stop there, Yo, but I mean, obviously you, I've been writing about Fisker before we did, and maybe this would be a good time for you to, to come in. Yeah, so my name is Jo Flores from Monet in, in Rotterdam, um, architecture uh, um, firm. And um, well, I was part of the editorial board of OASA Journal for Architecture, and we were actually uh, at that time dealing with uh, um, codes and continuities in architecture. Um, and this was trying to grasp um, an idea of 
um, architects throughout Europe that were um, from another um, uh, reading of modernity. So we would have the, let's say, the, the Le Corbusier's and um, the Arne Jacobsen, and uh, every country would have his own uh, hero of, of modernity that was celebrated and also um, in all the books. But there was always a sort of uh, shadow figure. And this was an essay by uh, Lacunyani, where he wrote about shadow figures in architecture. Um, and that were actually people that were um, most of the time um, 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 also building a substantial amount of, of work, but um, were just less known. Um, and that drove me to, uh, uh, to Fisker after seeing uh, uh, one of his uh, uh, buildings. And um, because it actually uh, uh, connects with, um, uh, yeah, let's say, a an, uh, an fascination for architects that are bridging this modernity with, uh, with classicism. That was one motive. And the other motive is a brick culture throughout uh, Europe, um, So, um, which is, of course, uh, our soil in the Netherlands, in Belgium, but also in, uh, in, in Germany, and that then also extended to Denmark. And, and then... Um, one of the things that um, really attracted me uh, in the work of Fisker, or I think is something that was just like uh, uh, Andrew just made this comparison with Le Corbusier, that, um, that Fisker actually um, also uses um, uh, figuration um, and conventions in architecture as, uh, as tools. Um, so besides being a functionalist, um, making everyday buildings. He uses um, in his formal language, quite uh, conventional uh, uh, elements um, recognizable and uh, for everyone. And I think that was also something that uh, is one of the strengths of his, uh, um, uh, of his work. Well, and I think uh, the essay um, is a sort of, um, uh, quite naive enthusiasm of first exploration of, uh, of what, um, yeah, in, in what context uh, fiscal was operating. Um, and I'm happy that it's uh, landed in this uh, book. Um, and um, it's indeed focusing on this one uh, project, the Doenega Garden. And um, last week, uh, by accident, I was in uh, Copenhagen again, and I uh, visited some of his uh, projects again, like um, uh, um, uh, like the Donninger Garden, but also um, um, some other, some of his others, and I'm again struck by his. Um, um, in some of his projects, he is he is rather uh, bold and brutal and uh, and robust, um, and that is something that is is in all his um, his housing projects that are let's say more um, in the in the central uh, uh, periphery or in the central part of uh, Copenhagen, there is this absolute embracement of urbanism. So he makes urban blocks, uh, urban housing um, 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 that really are, the, and the blocks have a scale that really make, uh, uh, make city. Um, and I think this is a um, uh, this is a good example, um, and still is a val valid example for how we could do housing nowadays. Actually, um, so um, I think um, yes, that's that's what I uh, have to say about it now. I, I might jump in, you know, just because uh, between some of the drawings Andrew clicked through at the beginning and that description, I think for us. There's a really potent thing in the work. Um, and it is about this drawing, say, that Andrew started on. And, and it's probably apocryphal, but they say, or there is only six drawings remaining in the archive of the building. It's this plan, which barely fits on the page because it's so big and it draws everything. Um, mm. Two elevation studies, and then a series of details. And for us, that filled us with a sense of optimism in a way for the agency of architecture, because as, as Job says, in a way, formally, they're brutal and you could say they're dumb. I don't think that they are, but strategically, he's not interested in big formal moves, although he's very clever formally in places. 
um, where he finds the empathy in the architecture is actually in its detail and construction. It's in his skill as an architect. And it's kind of amazing that, uh, and it was another reason we were drawn to this, that it was almost the centenary of the building. We went, I think it was Andrew 2018, and it was finished 2023. So in a year's time, it'll be a hundred years and it remains and its presence is as valid as it ever has been. In fact, probably it's, it's more potent than it ever has been. And I think its value is found not in a big polemic, but in the skills of an architect. And for me, that's a really reaffirming thing when we're in a situation currently due to the climate and various other things where actually a lot of that has been called into question in dialogues in, in the university and elsewhere. So I, I, I think that was another reason we thought it was a really important lesson for ourselves to witness and for our students to engage with. Yeah, I think you're right. I was chatting with um, somebody recently who uh, is a very well-known practitioner academic who was despairing about architecture and agency. And I was saying, well, if we're so irrelevant, how come there's more of us employed than at any point in human history? How come there are more schools of architecture than at any point in human history, more graduates, more buildings designed by architects? And he went, yes, 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 there's a lot more architects, but a lot less agency in each one. And I was going, is that such a terrible thing? Like, is it really awful that you don't have the power at a whim to reinvent a language, to reinvent a muscular formal intervention in the city. And I think there's something what Colin was saying about architectural agency with Fisker, which is maybe why he didn't catch as much attention at the time, which was that he didn't have the will to power, say, of Corbusier. He didn't want to wait and to force the world into his image. He worked with what was around him. And actually, in some respects, his influence was well, there's a good debate to be had about who had the greater and more long lasting influence, I think, in the sense that I'm just going to zoom in on this if the camera lets me, which is that this is so we've broken the, the book into three case studies, the block, which is a Hornbook house, the terrace, which is Vester So House and the square, which is Dronningen Garden. And this is drawing. This is a Hornbook house. And you can see the grain of the city around it made of perimeter blocks with an almost identical depth to Hornbeck House, with an almost identical attitude to a central garden to Hornbeck House. And actually, if you look over the city of, of Copenhagen, you see this typology recurrently appearing. And actually what you're seeing is the kind of the typological invention in something like Hornbeck House, liberating workers cooperatives to make huge sections of cities. And there's an amazing part of, there's an amazing photograph that Colm found in our research, which we couldn't find who had the rights to, so we couldn't put in the book, but it shows this building built first. And none of the surrounding context exists, just this building. And it imagines the city before it reaches it. It imagines the streets before they lap up to its shores. And what's really amazing about Fisker was the way that ideas walked off his buildings through the hands of other architects onto other buildings across the city. And again, this conversation about agency, agency not as invention, but agency as being intelligent enough to make ideas that are stealable, that improve the lives of others. And I think that there's something in that thesis of Fisker, which is very hard to find in, in other architects. I'm just gonna flip onto Vester Soho's because this motif of, you can see this ripple of the uh, balconies and these corner windows, which is this kind of idiom that he invents with this building, which you see in many, many buildings in Copenhagen, which makes this very rich interaction of the living space, the bedroom and a very tight outdoor space. And which is very interesting about that, that, that little device is the way that he then pairs it with the, the staircase. And so he makes this very interesting um, and really rich, quite tense moment where you're coming in under the moment where everything's weaving together. And this moment here that I'm talking about, and what's really interesting there is typically these units down here, they stop being houses at some point, they become offices. These are all houses up above, but this kind of very simple device that makes a kind of little liturgy in the city of coming and going, of looking into the corners of people's private rooms at the same time as you're not disturbing them. And again, an idea which 
we want to steal, but it's one of those ideas that is generous. You know, it doesn't require you reinventing a whole language to come at it or having a massive budget or any of those things. It's a different type of reading of architectural agency and probably one much more in keeping with our time, maybe. Yeah. It, it's also, Andrew, just a, it's a minor thing, but it's super pragmatic. Uh, like, I really like that the door to the balcony is on the inside face and it's sheltered. And it seems typically him that that would be the case, that there's a, a really sensible logic to the detailing of the building. And um, whilst that pragmatism exists, it also in, in its formal condition sets up this kind of movement across the facade, which is just so incredible. And the building wouldn't be a success without that sense of movement in it. And, the same detail occurs in Hornback House to do with the, the plaster band that makes uh, the reveals to all of the windows. And it seems like the most eminently practical thing to do because you're, you're sealing up against the window, you're giving a second layer against, against the water. But also it sort of dematerializes the wall. And, and that's where it gets really interesting for me is that, um, this language that sits somewhere between pragmatism, classicism, and modernism. And it, it, it has this incredibly, actually postmodern, slightly attitude about how he deals with the mass of these uh, buildings that he's making. And that's the point for me where formally he's brilliant, actually, because suddenly the dumb lump becomes, has movement and all of the weight of it uh, disappears. And, and I, I, I'm really filled with admiration as to what, what gives us that, which is the tiniest details that are almost about the weathering of the elements of the building. So. I've, <clears throat> I've noticed that the Droninger Garten uh, uh, block is actually the, the most eloquent um, um, in, in that sense that it has quite a lot of diversity um, and, and chopping up, although yeah, not this side actually that you show now on the on the left page, but yes, these sides here, he really tries to blend in a bit um, with the cityscape, I think, while the other blocks are more, um, yeah, almost autonomous um, in, in or making connections on a more abstract level. Um, but here there is actually a lot of gesture and, uh, uh, and diversity. Um, later, after describing this, I, I actually saw that there were much more um, um, blocks that only have almost one formal invention. And then, and the thing you just described about, um, uh, about how entrances and, and, and windows and, uh, and balconies are connected, that is not so much in here. I think. Well, the big invention I, for me is I think this one on the on the right page is where how he treats the lojas um, with a small um, um, a small band of, of bricks sticking out while simultaneously he's continuing the um, the bond of the uh, of the wall. Um, so there's no explanation of. Uh, a lintel um, or a change in in the in the brickwork. Um, it's just continuous, and I think that is also a sort of pragmatism, but also beauty and beauty in directness um, that we found in more of his uh, uh, of his uh, uh, projects. But back to what you just mentioned about the combination of the of the stairs with the. Uh, with the balconies and the, and, the, and the entrances, I think that is a very um, um, th that is also a very specific uh, talent that he has. Um, I think that was developed after doing a lot of housing, and um, that's also something which is pretty nerdish uh, in a positive way. I mean, we also get confronted with things like this: that if you do small shifts of half a meter, then all of a sudden. Um, a new world is opening within the boundaries, which are really limited of, um, of social housing and of housing. And then these small shifts really matter because they really make a change in uh, the everyday experience of an entrance hall, uh, outside space, um, and also the whole expression of the uh, block. 
And I've noticed that he's all that Fisker is doing attempts to uh, equalize a lot of his um, uh, facades. So not not so much this one, but um, the Hornbeck House is, of course, a very clear one. Um, but also in some of his other uh, projects, I he, he seems to make um, uh, the choice for one window and then covers all. Yes, exactly. This this project on the on the right side. Um, the staircases, uh, the, the 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 housing, they all are treated with the same window. Only the pattern slightly varies, and I think that is a um, yeah, that is a very not only efficient but also very daring approach. I mean, if if you imagine that Fisker comes from indeed this this classical background where he studied with uh, or um, uh, was was working for Hackman, um, then. He must have understood the whole classical vocabulary, and to to make then the step towards this sort of naked uh, uh, brick block is quite daring, I think, um, and that's that's beautiful, um, and that is also what. My, sorry. No, I, I apologies for going across you, but we were trying to put a word on that, which is, it's not repetition. I mean, repetitions used a lot in relation to Fisker. Because each each element, of course, in itself is has some care and some interest, but something happens in the way that they're assembled together that makes a matrix of them, which mm -hmm. is not repetitive. It's sort of singular, and at the same time, it's made of rep repeated elements, and much like you'd make a brick wall or something, where the repetition mm -hmm. is not the thing, it's the wall. And that gift that he has, which is that his buildings from a distance have some otherness like they definitely have an otherness and then when you come close to them what well, is just bricks and windows and it's terribly ordinary do you know what I mean like when you're walking mm -hmm. along that Hornbuck house it's no great thing but when you see it for the first time up the street the prow of the coins you definitely remark on it and I, I think there's something there where they're oscillating between I don't know cartoon and really close woven robust lived experience you know where they're just very practical things i mean these are two photographs of the same building that colin took which is this is the external facade of gulf's house and this amazing internal garden which you know it, it's just casually used by people all the time and i think mm -hmm. that, that, that it's the same window addressing both as what happens with hornbuck house but again just treated ever so slightly differently so that you get the same texture but you get a completely different feeling here the, the mm -hmm. plaster bands are omitted and you get a much more you know enclosed feeling as a consequence um and i think this conversation is a very good short time to explain why the book is what it is like yes we have some essays there's essays by colin and myself there's essays by martin soberg by paul Ferrold, um contextualizing the context of Fisker and his classical language, and then Job obviously with his essay about drawing and garden. But the bulk of the essays are the drawings and the photography of the buildings, because we kind of felt like you could, yeah, you could frame this critically as you want, and, and there's any number of ways you can take it. But what it is, is what we wanted to convey and give as much information that people could read into it. I mean, very small things like the way the half landing of the stairs makes the lantern to the doors in, in Hornbuck House, tiny, tiny things which seem incidental, but which are vital. And sort of in this, I mean, I enjoy Ram Kohlhaas's writings, but that kind of slight problem he has with bigness, which is that the scale, <laughs> the skills of the architect necessarily break down at scale. Well, I just don't think it's true. And I don't think it's necessarily the case. And I think that Fisker is sort of proof that it needn't be the case. You go back to classicism. There, we uh, we see architecture that has uh, various um, um, scales. So you have the big scale of the block, then you have the tiny scale of, let's say, the entrance, and in between, you might sometimes see three or four steps. And I think that is what Fisker is doing. He's not forgetting, but he's skipping a couple of these. Um, so. There is a notion of an in-between scale, which is in the, I would say, perhaps in the Hornbeck house, the rhythm of the entrances that are too high, but they are making a sort of subdivision in the long facade. Um, and then there's 
of course, the, the, the roof and the entrances, these, these are the parts that are subdividing. And then the notion of the bel etage, I would say also, and then, then it stops. Then we only have the window left, which is the smallest scale, I would say, which is very refined, like a, a jewel, I would say. And so, and I see I see this happening in, in, in more blocks, not so much in the Droninger Garten, because there he uses a lot of, uh, of these in-between uh, uh, steps, I think. Um, but I find that, again, it, it might be a bit of a repetition, but I find that very daring um, that he steps away from this, uh, especially when you're making housing, if you do an office block or I don't know what, but for housing to do such a thing and still remain um, a very, make a very humble and uh, a tangible block, um, which is largely, let's say, caused by the, by the usage of the material brick, I think that that counters this a certain hardness that is in the scheme, you could say, uh, that all of a sudden makes it very yeah, textile, um, everyday, uh, touchable. I think that is a, yeah, he must have, I mean, besides the sort of pragmatism, he was, he must have been very aware of this, um, I think, because otherwise it would have been also it could have also been a fully plastered facade um and and we've also seen examples of that time in in, in copenhagen where it was the brickwork was uh, was covered um and you would only sense it vaguely uh yeah and when i was then when i was going around i noticed that in the whole um scape of of copenhagen you you see a lot of, of, of normal brick buildings, but um, so I was at, at, at a certain moment, I was a bit in doubt whether in this context they are, are they so extraordinary? But then again, yes, they are extraordinary. They do stand out because of their robustness and their monumentality, I think. Um, but that is something that might be, that's something that you experience when you're when you're going around through Copenhagen. I think then you then you notice these differences. Yes. Yeah. But they are sort of electric. Absolutely. Uh, by comparison with some of the other some of the other brick buildings, uh, which don't have that same power. And it's interesting. The Hornback House has has an equivalent building very close to it. I think it's to the south of it. That is rendered, and uh, it's completely flaccid, in a way. And I, I wonder if the real skill is in is in a sort of tension of the surface, as you say, about about this textile quality that he's so good at making. Um, so I, for me, it's in the tension that's established in the fabric that he makes. It's so good, and it's there's something in that in that in how one draws actually, and in the drawings, I think, because the drawings are big, they're handmade. Um, everything is, in some cases, everything is drawn, which is an incredible thing to do when we're so used to having computers that we fill drawings with lines and pattern. But actually, when one is bodily moving across a drawing like that to hatch and, and make that fabric, I think you're incredibly aware of the the tension that's established between the openings and and the material of brick. Um, so I, 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 I think there's another thing here in Fisker and how he worked because the, the drawings are incredible, but also we haven't acknowledged that many of these buildings are made as collaborations. I, I think there is something at work, um, you know, in that he there's a generosity, I suppose, in in the crafting of the buildings, as Andrew and Yo point out, but there's also a generosity of spirit in how one engages in in their design. And I think I think we see, of course, these elements as as lek motifs, as almost typological elements that become part of the fabric of the city, that are shared. But but that must yeah. also be part of the conversation that existed in the studio when they were making these drawings. That actually it was. It was an active conversation between multiple uh, architects and others, and a conversation that exists between them and the city. And, and I think that should be acknowledged as well as, as being something um, maybe quietly radical. <laughs>
for architects in the same way that the buildings are yeah. as a way to practice it's in, i mean we all well hopefully we we all live to see our relevance you know and you know that's just the nature of generational thinking and i think towards the end of his life fisker was sort of considered that you know that this idea as column said that you would draw the plan over and over so meticulously and the elevations and at a time when you know the thinking of team 10 and others that there was a different attitude to how we drew thought about people and what's really interesting it was sort of like uh the fact that he didn't draw people uh taken as an indication he was just a purist interesting in the plan and the elevation now it's very interesting is that these buildings are loved by the people who live in them. Like a facade actually matters in a weird way. You go to the creche in, in Hornbook House and the kids are drawing houses and they're all Hornbook House and they kind of love it and the garden of it. And there's a sort of a thing there, which I think is very difficult to frame in architecture, which is that being attentive to the thing itself, to the, how it's made and how it composes does not mean you're not thinking about life. That can be happening in your head as you're drawing other things in the page. You know, I, I despair of the critic who comes into a college and says to a student, there's no people in your drawings. You don't think about people. And I just go, that's such a silly thing to say, because what, what we found really beautiful about this, and we couldn't print a lot of this research because it was the students' conversations with the inhabitants, is there are people who met their partners at the washing lines in the square of this building. There are families that have knocked several apartments in together. And this is in a housing association, one thing. So you can imagine the negotiations that happen with this. What's really remarkable then this plan is how, how he's responded to building regulations, which is that he couldn't build with a steel deck. So he had to use timber joists. So he needed a second means of escape. So every apartment gets this second back stairs. And what's amazing about that is that it's the much more heavily used stairs even though it's the meaner stairs, because it takes you to the garden where your bike is, where your washing is, and you go out to the city, and you might use the more formal stairs if you want to avoid people. And this idea that a building might have, yeah, empathy, and that understanding built into itself, I think, is something remarkable. The students were there for a week. They made these drawings the week after, which was a skills development exercise to do with drawing and looking, and then they did project work and they took phot photographs. We found essays by Yob and by other friends. And like the book actually was a gathering of things that already existed. It wasn't something that we, we had no budget, right? So it was just sort of like finding things and letting them come together. And then, you know, Val in Val Rose and Lund Humphreys and, and say Ellie Beaumont, you know, there's editing it and making sense of it, but it was all of this found stuff. And I think there's this sort of, uh, underlying pieces here as well to do with education, which is that schools can be an engine of research in this sense. They can be ways not, and to the detriment of the student's education, far from it, which is that you can actually make moments that allow things come together and let this knowledge be shared with the discipline in a very meaningful way. And I think that that's something that was really the unexpected, I think, Colin, we set out to do this. We remember we just wanted to do a small publication in Queens and then the Biennale happens and then now this happens. And Yob, your essay was sort of instrumental in helping us, I think, imagine that it might have a bigger, um, you know, voice in the world. And I think that's something really beautiful. That, like it's, you know, it's six years later now, but we're really proud of this book, but we didn't really make any of it. I mean, Colin took some of the pictures, but the students <laughs> made it <laughs> and friends made it. And I, I do like that attitude to it is, are we authors? I mean, we have to be put it down as authors. I don't think we are. I think we're the people who helped it come together, but the students in the educational context is something that really wouldn't have been happening without that in Queens and Belfast. So I might hand over to you in Queens and Belfast, Colin. To... I think that's an extremely elegant summation of the book, <laughs> Andrew. Thank you. Uh, I, 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 the only thing as you were talking, I was kind of thinking, um, and I think, uh, I suppose the thing we sort of admire in Fisker's work is also maybe that that there's a sort of patient power, I think. It's, I, it was two words that sort of struck me when I was reading the introduction earlier. And I think um, it's a really admirable quality that architects hold collectively is that patient power and, and Fisker's work and the work of our students is a testament to that. And it gives me, as I said, great faith in the agency of architects to make meaningful change, you know, and to make our cities 
um, which I think this is a, is a sort of incredible example of. And I think it's important to say that uh, don't be too humble because I think it was uh, very important uh, that, that you guys took the initiative to uh, make the book because um, I think um, everybody was uh, longing for this uh, to happen. And uh, because older, older books of Fisker are, let's say, uh, hard to get, hard to find, uh, even in English, even harder, I would say. Um, so uh, I think this is, uh, it's good that people, so especially you have done this, practicing architects, making a book about another architect that has passed away. That is, that is, um, that is uh, uh, important for architectural culture.